Well, hello, everyone. We've got one of those afternoon sessions where one can only hope we still have many other attendees trickle in. But if not, you guys are the lucky few. <laughs> so today we're going to talk a little bit about creating video ads that people actually want to watch. Um, very lucky to have such a, an informed and, frankly, quite interesting panel. Um, we have Moritz Lowe, uh, the VP of Sales from Time, Inc. We have Samantha Minish, if I said that correctly, Director of Mobile Video at Gannett, and Aaron Gallagher, the SVP of Digital Advertising for Scripps Networks Interactive, which includes you live. Let's see. Ah, the clicker. Oh, technology. So, I know you guys have been at this conference for a day already, and suffice it to say that a whole lot of people are watching video online. Um, this is not going to come to, to as a big surprise to this audience, uh, but uh, you know there are also a, a wide range of sources out there that are predicting that the video spend is going to climb. And if you think about the small piece of the pie that the uh, that the digital advertising market is currently um, able to nibble on. Um, any signs of growth are exciting, and so we obviously all want to be finding ways to get a little bit of this money. Uh, totals are expected to exceed six billion worldwide, according to Zenith Optimedia, and there are other sources that expect uh, are looking at either, even greater growth. Um, for example, eMarketer is looking at 5.7 billion this year and that number in the US alone, and that number climbing to 8 billion in 2016. So clearly there's a lot at stake, a lot of revenue at stake. We're hearing about video, um, the video, ad, digital video ad spend starting to eat up some of that big, delicious television advertising pie. And uh, you know, clearly we all wanna get, get a piece of it. Um, but unfortunately today, video advertising is something that well, at best, a lot of people are just kind of putting up with to get to what they really want to watch. Um, but the good news is that they, they actually do want to watch video, video advertising if it means they can watch content for free. So we need to find ways for video advertising to actually appeal to them. And frankly, if we want to keep getting those video ad dollars, we need it to actually work and achieve our, uh, our brand's objectives. Um, when we, you know, when people are interviewed about what they like or don't like in video advertising, they do have some pretty strong opinions. Uh, they want video ads to be more interactive. They want to be able to choose what they see, and they definitely want to see things that are relevant to them. Um, but right now, what we see is a market, in many ways, dominated by the television model of advertising. You see. 15 to 30 second ads that are placed in the pre-roll position so that people have to sit there and watch them. Um, and you know, the, the fact is if you give them the option to skip, they generally do skip. Um, but you know, that might not be such a bad thing. It'll be interesting to hear from our panel uh, because frankly, people get to skip in all kinds of other formats as well. I mean, if they DVR a program, they're going to skip a lot of the advertisements. If they're in a magazine, trust me, they're not sitting there flipping to the, to the ad pages first. So this isn't a new concept when we look at digital video. In any case, the, the efficacy of video ads is incredibly promising. Like the, the People make purchases based on branded content. They, they remember, they recall video advertising better than many other forms of display advertising. And there are st numerous studies that uh, cite the increased brand lift of video ads. So it's definitely worth the effort. So now let's figure out how the heck to do it well. And that is what our panelists are here to discuss with me today. I've included their names on this slide because I'm looking forward to hearing your questions uh, after we have a little bit of discussion. So let's start off with the idea of content creation, does it really all come down to, well, a good ad is one people will want to watch? Is it that simple? You're asking me? You start. <clears throat> you wow. <laughs> Where do I begin? No, I think it's, it's, it's pretty simple. A good ad is not good enough. You need some relevancy. Uh, you need a little bit of luck to come together. 
uh, what we've seen in cross television or IP delivered mechanism for video is that relevancy matters and whether that relevancy is contextual based on the programming you've chose or opted in to watch by turning a dial, clicking a button or clicking a mouse. Um, that absolutely matters. Then there's also, does it matter to you in terms of demographically and psychographically and making sort of some type of management? Then good creative can matter more. Uh, but you need a bit of luck, a little bit of serendipity, but most importantly, there's a recipe for doing that. And I think there's kind of three, there's two different extremes. There's, you know, a simple, well-aligned pre-roll and branded integra uh, integration are kind of like the two ends of the spectrum that can be equally effective given the right recipe for success, contextual align, and so forth. Samantha? Yeah, I actually, I, I completely agree with, with those points that you can have the best ad in the whole world. It can be beautiful, it can be touching. Um, but so not only do you have to have this great ad that, that somehow is, seems relevant to somebody, but you have to give it to them in a relevant context. Um, and though there, there can be some randomness there, you know, a, a truly we've seen some ads are going viral these days, which is something crazy. It used to be something that only content folks dreamed of, and now ads can do it. And I find myself sometimes watching ads for, to watch a viral ad. <laughs> you know, I, I watch an ad pre-roll for, and then, because I'm waiting for this two minute long viral ad from, you know, Budweiser or whoever. Um, so, you might be a little bit biased in that regard, though. No, that, that watching good advertising is something you would invest a little time in? Well, I, I think it can be. I mean, I think that if it, I think if an ad touches you, and it's just like any other piece of content, if there's this ad that somehow reaches out to you and says, here's this great message, whether it, you're going to share it, I mean, we're just in a world of very contextual sharing. And um, it's true with content, and I think that we've just crossed that boundary of, what is truly content advertising is no longer just this quick spot that you saw on TV, maybe you saw, maybe you didn't, you know, maybe you got up. It's now it's something that, that you can see in multiple places and can be considered a piece of content all on its own. I mean, I, it seems as if that would actually affect the creative process. I mean, you're talking about some of those connections that people make with content. We're all, con we're all in the content business. So those connections that people make with content that are very genuine, very real, that lend themselves to that viral <laughs> the spread that we all long for. It yeah. sounds so gross, doesn't it? But we really want that. <laughs> but, and, and I think there, there has to be a variety of content that you're producing as well. It can't be just one piece of pre-roll that is then played over and over and over again. You know, I think from a creative standpoint, having, uh, being able to tell that story in short form and create multiple pieces of content that could be a part of um, a, a pre-roll campaign is important. I don't think that anyone, it, that everyone is doing that right now, but I, I think that's where, you know, you want to make sure that you're providing a good payoff for the consumer. Um, I think there's still work to be done on the, the ad creative side. So specifically with regards to the ad creative side, I think a lot of people say, well, you know, if I'm, if I'm Ford, I can make great brand creative. Do you have to have a high budget to make something that's going to resonate with consumers? Not necessarily. Um, you know, I think that there, and, and I think in the, the branded entertainment space, that is um, a place that a lot of a lot of marketers are going to kind of get beyond just pure digital advertising and pre-roll. Um, I think if you if you want to produce quality content, you do have to make the investment, though. That that's often the challenge is that you, you know, if you want great talent to be a part of it, even in the digital video space, if you want great quality, there is an investment that needs to be um, a part of the mix. All right. Well, I I have seen in one of the th the things that works very well in online video, especially with. Uh, branded content and ad, and ad based content is educational content how to you know do you think that that will work for a wide variety of brands is that a specific goal is i mean a specific approach that, that works better for some than others i mean i, I think it, it it again it depends on the the environment it's you know working at scripts and being um working across the hetv side of things we 
you know, we produce a lot of how-to content mm -hmm. for our consumers, and, and that's why people would come to us from a digital video perspective. Now, you know, they may come to get content about our, our shows like Property Brothers or House Hunters, but a lot of people are coming online to get how-to content as well. It, you know, I think great video advertising that would be tied to that would complement that experience. So, you know, if it is... Uh, well, Marissa, that comes back to your contextual point, doesn't it? It's like if that fits with your brand and what people are looking to you for, you know, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, some people try to wedge it in there. You've got to be relevant in the relevant environment and the mindset to learn something. Also, too, for some brands, how-to is table stakes. Mm -hmm. They actually got to explain to people how they use the products, and it's expected you're going to put that content out for a lot of things, you know, whether it's last night I'm assembling beds from Pottery Barn for my kids. <laughs> right. I don't look at a manual anywhere. I go and found a how-to video from Pottery Barn that was produced that was out there. They may have, in fact, run on scripts before. Yeah. Uh, I'm expecting that. It's table stakes. So I think looking at the brand and, and set of products. Uh, also, too, their, their fun side of how-to. You know, okay. putting your place out of context is a great way to create awareness. It may not drive ultimately that purchase intent but I think you can have fun and almost a, a sarcastic approach uh, to how to as well, to have fun with it. And that's another way to capture uh, a viral audience. So let's take a, a little peek at a video from one of you from Scripps. Um, this is the one This is what I've been most adventure. excited about. We're doing this. I'm telling you, you gotta check this out. We're so happy right now. This is crazy town. I just had the adventure of a lifetime. I'm going to be a student at one of the most prestigious culinary institutions in the world. We're going fly fishing. Man, this guy is strong. On the beach. Beautiful. Look at the view. Hi. When relaxing, remember to relax. My own private feast. Mm. Who's ready to eat some steak? Look at that. Could this day get any better? every good word you could think of in the book for this stuff. We should do this more often. This has been an epic one-tank adventure. So, so I can give a little background on that. Yeah, I was going <laughs> to ask if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, um, so, so youlive.com is the video portal and distribution network that we built at Scripps, and we launched it about a year ago. And Ford, as you saw there, uh, was part of the launch for YouLive. So we created a branded entertainment series with Ford, and that, that was um, a highlight reel of just some of the content that we created for them. Um, but I think you know, from an advertising perspective, the branded entertainment side is, is really key. You know, I think everyone's you know, the, thinking about how to get beyond just building pre-roll content and having their content their, and their brands built into content that we're producing. That was an example of that. So One Tank Adventure, is a series that we created for Ford where we worked together uh, with three distinct talent at Scripps and created nine different videos, um, three different series, nine different videos where we actually integrated Ford into the content that we were producing. So um, it was, you know, I think it's a way that we're, uh, you know, obviously pre-roll and, and working with our partners to embed pre-roll around our content is key, but the, the branded entertainment side is, is a, a big area of focus for us. Did, uh, was the client receptive to the idea of using your talent as part of their commercial or creating whole fresh content around your talent? Essentially, it's more around your talent. I watched, I've actually seen the full It is, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I think it's, it's they, they, this isn't something that just completely hits you over the head with Ford. And you can, you know, it, it's much more about they wanted to figure out how to subtly integrate their products into content and tap into our talent. So, um, you know, you wouldn't necessarily know that that was Ford other than through some of the integrations that Pretty we subtle. did throughout. Um, so I think, you know, it's from a client agency perspective, it's, you know, it's kind of a mix. You, you want to have that presence of your, you know, your commercial and your, your actual pre-roll video ad that's running around across the web and within relevant environments, but being able to also build that relationship with consumers through product integration, I think, is really key. So you touched on something that's going to take move me a little bit more into the technology side of things for, for all of our panelists. Um, so there's a lot of talk about placement. Is pre-roll best? Is, should there be interstitials? What I read is that Really, you need the messaging to exist kind of subtly everywhere 
so that the video is something that people will want to watch? Do you try to build out a campaign that is more than just a pre-roll position, a commercial in a, in a given context? How do you approach it so that it's more effective, frankly? So um, USA Today actually has a great example out right now. We've got a partnership with Verizon where um, so they're integrated, the, the, it's part of our USA Now franchise. So that gets into a lot of times with, within a news organization, we're often told we run into things where um, you, know, it, it's, you can't predict the news. Um, so how do you build content around something that you can't predict? And, um, and then you, sometimes you run into, you've got bad news. You know, so Cruise news. to put those ads maybe right Cruise there. news is not usually good news, um, for example, <laughs> but that's a major player. Travel is, is a major section. So we have a, we have a, a, a news-based franchise that we've built. It's a produced package. It's got simple branding on it, um, and it's USA Now brought to you by Verizon. And um, wherever that shows up, it shows up in outside of just, it's a very simple, um, skippable, pre-roll ad, and we have that in just that basic, um, but outside of that, then there's there's exterior branding, whether it's, we've got skinning, we've got options where it, it syncs up with the different um, ads on the page. We have different placements throughout the branding of that piece of content in general, um, and we can produce two, three, four of these a day around a news subject, which is unpredictable, but we can get predictable results for an advertiser because that's what an advertiser wants. They want predictable results and they want guarantees and they want that immersed experience. So you've, you've got this up and now and the, the ad is very much based on the now, the innovative, the, these, these are the things that, that Verizon is helping with. And so that brands very, very nicely with this focus of news now that's going on. And um, did you create that product with them for them or that was sold to them? Actually, we created it. Um, it, it was a franchise that, that came under a different name and we had been kind of cooking along with that. And then um, they came to us and said, hey, we have this innovative line that we'd like to push and, you know, or that's kind of the track we'd like to take. And so it all kind of merged together nicely. And so that's one example of where we, we merged two separate ideas together. Um, and, but we're also very open to, we have these buckets of categories that we say, look, we could easily bucket content for you in a similar fashion um, when we go out and we shop to advertisers so that we can start with that. Here's a branded experience. It's an integrated experience. It's really part of our daily content. It's part of our thought process. It fits with the news cycle, but at the same time, you never have to worry as much about, for example, you know, because it is pre-produced, it's, it's not gonna accidentally show up on some horrible piece of content. You know, we, we do have some control over it. Do, uh, do you have an opinion? You don't have an opinion on whether that we ever want to do pre-roll? I've been in the news for a, for a long time, so I'm just <laughs> kind of laughing cruise ships and I've been through all that time before. <laughs> Uh, well, I think, you know, something I learned is Mark Marble is our, our director of video strategy here in uh, uh, sitting out here. We worked at a previously at a, at a news company with it's got a three letter acronym in front of it. And he developed a platform uh, based on choice. It's about value exchange. Right? And there's different scenarios where consumers are fine with a 30 second pre roll. The petting might be a longer form co co uh, piece of content. And in this particular case, um, the first thing, I was about five or six years ago, Mark developed this program where a consumer had a choice. They could pick an ad that was very short or a long form from a pharma company that had fair balance issues and watch the entire programming, 22 minutes, packaged up without it being interrupted further. And when they give them a value exchange, not that we're always going to give people choices and forks in the room, but if you line up, hey, a, a 60 second ad in front of 22 minutes of the mm -hmm. programming and let people know that's coming, they're more likely to accept. If it's a mobile format where it's quick on the news, mm -hmm. it's seven seconds or less, it needs to be a skin, it needs to be experience wrapped around it. And I think, you know, as publishers or producers of content, we have to help steer our clients in the right direction and make sure our consumers are getting the value, understand what they're going to get in return. Uh, that's a key piece. Do you find that a lot of the agencies and the marketing side basically wants to run a TV commercial? And is that a good or a bad thing? Uh, I think everybody wishes they could just run a TV commercial, right? Uh, but you got to make money from creative, you got to make money in your strategy side, and media buying is getting squeezed. Uh, and so I think, you know, if anybody's smart, whether you're in the client or agency side, you want to have the right ad format, the right ad content for the right experience. 
and I think we can all probably say as publishers, we've done original video series and these great things, and then they give us a standard 30 second pre-roll yeah, yeah, that's not yeah. relevant to anything. Yeah. You're like, why did you make us go through these fiery hoops and you're just gonna give us this piece of- I have a feeling this happens to you a firm. 30 like, seconds worth of crap. Yeah, and, and it's, you know, I think it's the, um, as we move forward, be thinking about each format differently and it, mobile, you know, it, it, a 30 second spot in a mobile environment is Yeah, that just a made me die a little thinking good about thing. it. Good thing. But that, you know, I think it's interesting with, um, you know, we're, we're partnering with Twitter on their Amplify product and um, we, we just announced that over the last month or so. And you know, the idea, what we're focusing in on is, if we've got, um, we have our content on air, we've got great content online, but then if we're gonna push content out that's tied to an on-air program across Twitter, we're gonna make sure that the content we're producing is a, a quick snippet of, of information, you know, a 15 to 30 second clip, and then that's preceded by a, a six second Twitter uh, you know, pre-roll that runs within that environment, okay. I, and that works. You know, I mean, I think that's that's smart to think about. Each environment, you know, needs to have branded advertiser content that's tied to it, but it needs to be shorter if it is a quick clip. Um, so I, I think people are getting there, and I think that will help in some ways. You know, knowing that if you're pushing out a, a 15, 30 second video clip from a brand, you you only will precede that by a six second advertiser message. So what about these, this issue of skippability? I mean, you're, you know, skippability and choice. These are two of the things at the, the beginning of the session I talked about, this is what people want. They want to control, they want to drive. Should we let them? So, I mean, Gannett in general is, is taking the, um, <laughs> yeah. Um, we're taking the approach that the user, we've, we know that our content is, we know from that perspective that people are more likely to stick with our content longer for more pieces of content if they're able to interact even in the smallest amount. So, Is this um, on mobile specifically or across digital Across, across okay. the board. Um, but it really started, the wave really started with mobile. We were getting just thrashed in the app store as far as our, our video. We were having an, a 30 second ad before every video. And that just wasn't doing anything for our numbers. <laughs> um, so uh, when we made a change, we made a change to add skip button and we made a change to on our phones, we limited the length of the ad. It cannot be longer than 15 seconds. It's, it's just policy across the board. Can't be longer than 15 on a, fit, on a phone. Um, and we added that little bit of interactivity and then we reduced the frequency of the ad so that you're not seeing an ad before every single video you watch. Those little things which initially sales went, oh, shit. <laughs> Um, you know, they, they saw their inventory being cut in half, but ultimately what it did is it drove consumer loyalty to our brand. So even though we still have those generic ads in more places than not, and it drove that loyalty to a, a place to where our bottom line is actually bigger now than it was with fewer frequency and users are in theory watching shorter and less ads, they're watching even more of them ultimately, even though they're the opportunity is so much smaller. Yeah, I mean, so, it's, it's counterintuitive, but it's good to hear. Less is more on yeah, mobile. Yeah, I mean, they, I guess giving people the feeling that, you know, I mean, the whole thing with having a whole computer in your, in your hands is that you feel in control. And so when you take away that control, people get upset and they go somewhere else. But if you give them even the slightest amount of control and give that back to them, they seem to be much more interactive and, and much more susceptible to sitting through what we know isn't going away quickly, but we'll certainly, we can evolve, we can evolve everybody at a, at a much more comfortable pace. Any advertiser pushback? You, uh, do they mind if you skip? I think everybody knows. Either give them the keys or they're gonna steal the keys. There's gonna be a way around it. So it's like when I was 14, my you must dad- have kids. My, when I was 14, my dad's like, man, you're just gonna steal the car in the middle of the night anyhow. Just don't drive more than three miles from the home. Uh, not to say it's good parenting advice now that <laughs> my kids are getting older, uh, but they're parents. gonna figure it out, right? They, whether they're gonna, what'll happen is alternatives, well, they'll hack, they'll go through an alternate website, there are alternate universes out there, mm. they'll go through distribution mechanisms we don't like. It's, you know, what the music industry has learned is a uh, pretty hard lesson. Mm -hmm. Gave it to them, they'll get it there anyhow. And so if we give them skippability, not that we're really doing the time.com right now, but we will in the future, uh, but making sure that, <laughs> that mobile video ads aren't 30 seconds right off the bat. We're pretty hardcore on that. 
uh, getting the time-based ad serving, so you're not just slamming a 30 every Into 30 every seconds, I think is a very important strategy that also uh, uh, Mark had developed before, that value exchange is yeah. super important. And I think, I think testing out those different models is key too. It's like, you know, if you, um, if you are looking at serving pre-roll content at every, you know, certain number of minutes within a user experience, and you, you've got to test and see what works, whether you lengthen that out or shorten it. it um, you know, I think everyone's still kind of in like a test and learn phase with some of these things, but um, yeah, it's... Uh, well, it's, it's interesting you say about the test and learn phase, uh, because what I wonder uh, is success metrics. Like, how do you now take whatever... So we used to just hear about branding, and, and it was so vague and pleasant and warm feeling. And now everybody wants to see numbers for everything they do. So what are the success metrics? Is it sitting through the full ad? Is that the metric? Or is it an interactivity metric? Did I click? Did I act? Did I tweet? You know, how do you define that with advertisers and what, what works? What should they be looking at? I think they should be looking at everything. And it also depends on the product. Is it a product? Is it a service? And where type of campaign? Is it awareness? Is it intent? Or is it drive to action, to, to a call to action, and look at that appropriately. Uh, I think what, what happens is people put on a branding ad, but then measure it on ROI metrics, such as click. Right. That is crap and needs to be stopped immediately. <laughs> I think I'd ban that from the world if I had that button. Um, <clears throat> but people got to look at a, a multitude of metrics, and it's difficult to do that. I think there's new companies out there like Chartbeat, some interesting things from Moat. They're showing engagement metrics. They're looking at eyeball tracking. They're bringing the measurement beyond just clicks and hover over. I think we've got to expand that. But until those things get at scale and create benchmarks, it's difficult to manage the campaigns. But you know, they, often the agency's like, oh, this is the way we're gonna measure it. And the client's like, I didn't get that many hits on my website, you know, and think it's a failure. Uh, and I, you know, sometimes you can take advantage of the chaos and sometimes the chaos overcomes you uh, when it comes to this. My answer is we need a lot more refinement to it. It feels that way. It feels yeah. like we're just yeah. there, and as I mean, you, and as I you think mentioned. audience yeah. measurement and reach of, of, of target demographics is also key. And again, but I think it's an evolving landscape right now where there are still, um, you know, the, the audience measurement tools that are out there are not as uh, accurate as they probably need to be. So there's a bit of caution that every publisher or media company has in terms of going down that road. But that's really looking at how you translate the TV model more into you know, the, the digital. Um, Demographics and yeah. reach and, yeah. and those types yeah. of very specific yeah. things. I do think, though, theoretically, at least on the mobile, you should be able to do that better, no? Yeah, I mean, I, I, think, that, I, mean, I think that that's the goal. Um, but often, it, you know, it, it seems like, I mean, I'm sure a lot of us have had a, a phone in our pockets for a long time, so it seems like something that should just be a, a second nature and that it should be much more advanced but i think that we're still there's not a lot of industry consistency which also makes it tough you know you, you've got three different advertisers that come to you and they all have experience with some other companies and, and everybody's trying to test and evolve which is great and we all need to do that and because but because there's that inconsistency and because we haven't found what that magic potion is yet as far as you know measurement and features that you offer um, there's, they come to you and, and you've got three different advertisers that want three very different metrics that may or may not necessarily equate to success. I mean, success on a, on a news organization is, you know, we were able to show, for example, that completion rate didn't fall when we added the skip button. Um, but that, that ultimately anybody who was going to skip an ad was probably not going to watch it in the first place. Right, they were going to be multitasking. Mm -hmm. Right, right. So um, particularly on mobile, and, and it did wonders for so many other things, and we were able to show that overall at the audience, but there were still advertisers who said, well, but there's, they're not actually getting to the end of my ad. And so you have to have that, that dialogue and that back and forth to find with each advertiser as you go. And do you think that's the way it should stay, or do you think we really need to come up with some metrics that we can begin to compare? I, I think at some point we have to come to some sort of I mean, audience measurement, we know we have to get there. Yeah. Right. I mean, yeah. yeah. comp score. and audience measurement are really the two key factors, I think, that that will be defining for digital video Yeah. down the road. And, it, and I think I, I, I would say that I would think that see that that is probably the, the thing that most marketers are now looking at the most mm -hmm. when it comes to pure digital 
video advertising. And again, they they may be now looking there. Yeah. But. But it's not. It's, it's not know, quite it's, there. It's yeah. closer. I agree. We're, yeah. We've made some strides. Yeah. Well, I just think uh, viewability is a hilarious example of all this. Look at just display viewability that's going on there. You've got Comscore VCE, got our buddies over at Integral, Nielsen's got a solution. They're all MRC certified, which is supposed to be measuring in the same standard. I've tested all three of them, and the results are just really? upside down. Uh, then you look at Vindico just put out actually a really good study, I think, on viewability and quality of video ads versus television. Right, and they're saying television's the A standard. When I'd say linear television is probably the D standard, you know, in comparison, like, oh, it's a quality experience. Well, like uh, an old friend of mine taught me, Jay, hey, one of the DVR, one's a DVR invented, and I said, when, when was it, Todd? So 1957. That's the day the remote came out. <laughs> uh, you could just skip the ad by flipping through channels, mm -hmm. but yet the format of this panel-based uh, 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 measurement of TV ads is a joke. However, TV pricing kind of just baked into, right? If you're doing your upfronts right now, you're looking at three, four, seven, maybe $10 CPMs, and we're out there trying to pedal $35, $65 mm -hmm. CPMs, and then doing our down and dirty, you know, network deals there in the teens. Uh, we haven't quite factored into our pricing. As much as we hear about the scale of video, it hasn't reached the scale of linear TV programming, and that's when I think things can all get equal. Um, but the discrepancy in, in measurement in the quote unquote, the world of accountability is hilarious how, how and you would you would put that down to viewability not sheer audience size I mean when you look at the audience numbers you still see that TV everybody watches TV everybody watches loads of TV well that's because three people are watching it all at the same time all the time <laughs> that, I, I do think you in order to be you have to have a scale story in order to compete in the digital video space you know if you if you in order to build a business you've got to be able to scale it in the right way I and mean, that was the big reason for building out ULIV and our distribution network is because it allows us to have, you know, we've got our owned and operated brands, but then we can distribute our scripts content out across our ULIV network, which is, you know, across partners like Yahoo and AOL and Hulu and YouTube. And it allows us to push that branded content that we own out across the web and do it at scale. That's, you know, where I think things need to move in order to be able to, to compete. So it's interesting that you specifically mentioned your partnerships with with those uh, big, mm -hmm. those <laughs> big audience places like YouTube, for example. And I wanted to go ahead and, and show your video now, if I may, mm -hmm. and then we'll jump into the whole idea of context and where is the best way, where's the best place to get the message across. Manufacturing in the United States means advanced technology. Technology allows us to be craft-oriented. Siemens designed and built the right tools and resources to get the job done. Many people have written about, talked about, ad nauseum about the past of Detroit. It's very well known. Everything was good back then, and it seemed like as I got older, it kind of like went down. It was always in my mind to possibly leave one day, uh, leave Detroit, just because of the lack of workforce. But the story of Detroit is not about the past, it's really about the future. It's a manufacturing center of the world, almost. Today, Detroit is, a, is, is very different in terms of the nuances uh, than it may have been several years ago or several decades ago. A lot of young people, a lot of innovative people, a lot of uh, very creative and artistic people are moving there. And the idea then is pulling all these parts together. And then you get Shinola. How many people know what Shinola is? You guys are not very hip. <laughs> what? <laughs> Isn't that Shinola? So Shinola is uh, uh, a company that was created by one of the founders of Fossil, Fossil Watches. People know Fossil Watches, heard of that one? Like Swatch, all right. Good, good. All right, so welcome to the 90s. Now in 2014, uh, 2014, Shinola is just one of these, uh, everybody in Brooklyn knows them. So Shinola is a really interesting story, and it wasn't actually the advertiser here, but the advertiser was Siemens. Siemens really wanted to get around the story that, hey, a lot of good things are happening in, in America. Uh, they weren't looking for a bastardized branded uh, uh, content experience. They just want to know what are the positive stories about America's rebirth. And actually manufacturing, oddly enough, is a segment that's coming back to the U.S. because of 
equipment like that Siemens produces, robotics, allow the craft manufacturing or bespoke manufacturing is coming back to the U.S. Shinola is this little company in Detroit that starts cranking out cool watches. They're 500 to 1,000 bucks, but they're made in the U.S. They're craft. They make really cool watches and handbags, and it's this great story. So here we have kind of just simple contextual alignment. And as Aaron said, you need scale when that, when that magical alignment of uh, behavioral and demographic. But if you go to contextual, people will pay attention to this ad. They had the right creative message. We didn't even tell them what it was. We just told them what we're covering in general. And they went out and created craft kind of a beer experience showing that manufacturing can help small industry, not just big industry, move America forward. And that alignment and the metrics for engagement and completion on that campaign have been phenomenal. Uh, and we've also been doing some dynamic logic studies and really happy that uh, the way that's performed. And there's an example, kind of the opposite end of the spectrum, and not contrarian to, 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 to Aaron's viewpoint here, but you can make it work there. It doesn't have to be tons of scale. I think that's, Alignment that's where I would, he took it exactly where I was headed with it, because there, I think the classic media argument is that context matters, that we don't just bring you a big audience, we bring you the right audience. And so when you say that about scale, and I think about uh, delivering via YouTube or partnering via YouTube, as opposed to pulling to your site, drawing to your site, or um, you know, if you're a brand, do I put it on the script site, my how-to video, or do I want to go straight to YouTube with it or try to put it on my own site? You know, there are lots of different really good arguments that can be made, and I'm sure a lot of marketers go straight to scale. <laughs> We just want to reach as many people as possible. Yeah, well, I, I, I'm, I'd be curious to know how. So with that example and with the great content, like really um, quality content that's produced, is that Shinola video or that content series then being distributed more widely? So that Shinola piece was actually pure edit. We just yeah. focused on a great manufacturer. Yeah. yeah, of course we're distributing it yeah. everywhere. Uh, with the, Siemens, with the, messaging. Uh, no, not all the time. So some of the times we have partnerships to position on different social platforms. There's sometimes we just push it out there uh, mm -hmm. as well. I think before, part of my strategy with time is a time everywhere strategy. Put the content out there, let it be free, but use clever technical partnerships to actually allow clients to follow along with that earned media. And that's where we want to hit that sweet spot and saying, hey, if I do something really cool with you and it does become a hit, I want to come along for the ride. Mm -hmm. And we've gotten pretty good at it. I wouldn't say we've mastered it. We've, when you we've say come a long way cool technical years. partnerships, could you give us a little more specific? Um, who do I want to shout out here? <laughs> uh, so Radium One is somebody we use in social media. So if somebody thinks takes off, we can push and we can retarget through there, through other platforms out there. Obviously, Blue Kai. And then we're looking at, we have a partnership with a company called Proximic. Um, so we can figure out contextually where it's happening across Time Inc. and other partners are out there so we can align the right message when it gets pushed out as well. So some, uh, some great companies are out there. Um, do either of you have an opinion? Is there, is there a right time to, to get out there and ma be making those, those distribution deals or should you be you know, focusing on your own ecosystem? I mean, I, th I think the... I think the natural trend of the industry is that people are going to find the content somewhere. Um, so why not have them find your content wherever they may be? Um, it's sort of that go to your audience. So that, that's part of the reason we've had such a huge push on the mobile devices. Um, and that's why we've had, we're starting to, to ramp up our own distribution deals that if you've got this content and people are over here, there's no reason that, that there's no reason that just because they're over here doesn't mean that they, they aren't going to love whatever your piece of content is, that they aren't going to, to see that and say, that's really contextual to this audience over here, even though they don't necessarily fit with my grand main audience. And so you can reach them. If, if you're producing these, these huge numbers of content, then you have to reach them wherever they are. And I think restricting yourself um, to only fit within your own bubble is is just that it's just it's very restrictive and it and it keeps you stuck in your place. So if you make it very easy, particularly for video, it, it's got such a high barrier of entry. So if you've got somebody who's willing to watch your content wherever that may be, I, I think it you just naturally have to move to a place where they can watch that wherever they may be. And and that's the user behavior pattern now. It's like the people are used to accessing content across multiple platforms, multiple de devices at all different times, and you know, it's it, there's not a lot of people out there who are creating great quality content. So you, you've got to. <laughs> there's a lot of people making content. Yes, but yeah, it's it's the great quality, 
Yeah. Subjective, I suppose. But I think it, whether you, you know, if you're watching um, a clip from Property Brothers on HGTV.com, or you How happen. How do you know I watch that show? You just, you keep looking you at like me. like it? I do. <laughs> <laughs> or if you find that uh, across a distributed network, it's like, you, you know the brand, you know the content. I don't think the consumer is concerned about where they need to be watching it, okay. as they once were. So let's talk a little bit about interactivity. I hear a lot about the fact that video advertising is more effective when it's interactive. And Moritz, you touched on it with the idea of what, is there a call to action? Like, is that what they're trying to do? <coughs> um, I mean, should it all be interactive? Should, if nothing else, should I be able to tweet it? Should I be able to engage with it in some way uh, to encourage that viral goal that we're all looking for? Simply, <coughs> so turn off my mic and cough. <coughs> Take your time. We'll, we'll wait. This is a poor cigarette to have before I walked in here. Sorry. Hey, hey. I'm kidding, kidding, kidding. <laughs> uh, so I think everything should be allowed, but not have to force it in there. I think subtly, any, any, any human on the web these days expects the content to be shareable. When they do share, it's because of relevancy and recency. They don't share stuff that's old. They don't stuff share, share that's, that's hyper-relevant. Uh, I think so that's very important. And your expectations as a marketer for your stuff being shared should be Hey, if you put it in a really relevant place and it's really fresh and new, it, it can happen. Uh, but if it's old and stale and it's that 30 second spot they've seen a thousand times and it doesn't get shared, don't blame the publishing partner you're working with. Uh, there's, there's something wrong there. And I think create, making more creative ways for us to share, there's still a lot of improvement. You know, uh, It's whether that share, I don't know if that share bar needs to get bigger or a lot smaller. Uh, but I think we still have a long way to go with shareability and obviously in a television screen that'll be the next foray as apps make uh, not just uh, uh, over the top experiences mm -hmm. but programming that's coming through a cable mech, coaxial cable actually shareable as well. That's going to be really interesting. Because like you, I do sit down at my computer and look up advertisements. And I'm not in the advertising industry, but I'll just say to my daughter, you've got to see this Caterpillar Jenga ad. You've got to see this thing. It's just amazing. So I know that I'm not the only one. You're not, you do it too. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that, um, so um, when, you, when you think about interactivity as far as shareability and all of that and the level of, of effort involved in that, um, you also have to think about the platform that you're reaching out to. Um, so the mobile platform is inherently, you're, you're touching it and your, your fingers are all over it. Um, and so, and chances are you're distracted while you're on your phone, you're either at work you're in a meeting, you're sitting right here doing it now, <laughs> um, or you're watching TV, the number of people who are interacting with a tablet or a phone while they're watching TV is growing astronomically. And so when you've got all these people doing all these different things, it naturally leads to audiences almost expect their, their brains to be fragmented and to be doing three things at once. So to give them that opportunity to do three things at once within your own experience, then they're a lot less likely to seek somebody else's experience somewhere else to satisfy that, that social need to, to touch and to do things with it. Hmm. Um, and we also have found that the, the interactivity seems to be much higher, particularly on tablet. Um, so if you're, going to an, if you're approaching an advertiser and you say, hey, we really need, we want to make sure that, that interactivity is part of this and you know, how can we build this in? Um, Building that in for, for tablet would make so much more sense, and having that functionality would make more sense there. Um, whereas on desktop, you have more time, you can think about it, and so if you're on the web, um, it, it, it could be a very different type of interactivity that would, that would do better. But we have found that the interactivity is naturally higher on a tablet, um, which was very interesting to us. And so any sort of campaign that comes in that says, hey, you know, we want it to go viral and all of that, then we can work, wouldn't we all? Um, we work with them to make sure that, that tablet is part of that spend, um, which is, at the moment isn't always the case. Um, it isn't, they they're, don't. They're still fragmenting okay. and buying, and I think that that's kind of necessary depending on which creative you have. You know, in theory, you should do one deal with one advertiser and then you have one creative for desktop that works better with that audience, and then you have a shorter, perhaps more interactive experience for your tablet and your mobile, mobile users as well. And I think that that's where you have to differentiate where that ad is gonna show up. 
and do you think about that effort. at you live because I mean certainly um, I think of your content as desktop content but that's because that's where I consume it so yeah. that doesn't mean a darn thing does it yeah I mean I, I don't like I sit down with yours I want to sit there but yeah I mean well I mean the content is um, you know we have a mix of long form and short form content on you live so on our own and operated properties you're gonna find more of the long form content so actual you know uh, 30 minute episodes but on you live that's where we're doing more short form content. It's all between, you know, three to five minutes uh, each segment that we're producing. Um, but I still, I still don't see that there's much of a, a difference of the creative that we're getting no. from. Do you marketers. think you should be getting different creative? I think so. I mean, I, I think that there's. It doesn't mean we're going to get the, the type of content or the type of message or ad message that you put within long form content versus short form content is. Is, should be different. It's, it's a quicker viewing experience. It should be a shorter message uh, within short form or in if you're on a, a mobile or a tablet device. But um, I, I still just, you get the same creative, the same 15s and 30s, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And I don't see that people are at the point yet where they're able to differentiate that. And I think a lot of that comes down to budgets and not being able to you know, create all of these different <laughs> assets for all of these different devices. It's, it's just the part of the the model in the you know digital video and, and advertising world that that's challenged from that perspective. Yeah, I think there's some uh, interesting. T one thing to think about interactivity is uh, you can build it into the creative, or you can bring it in after the fact. And uh, there's a company that Mark's working with called Touchcast. And everybody, if you want to check out something really cool, check out Touchcast. I swear it's one of the cooler things we've seen in a long time. And Touchcast has the ability to bring interactivity, real-time interactivity, real-time data to content that's already been shot. Oh. So let's say you have a news show, right? And it's about some things that are kind of evergreen, the update, but then there's new, there's new information. You can post-production implement new data into that show or bring a native experience into that show. So, hey, somebody, uh, you know, some conglomerate wants to make the world more green. Uh, you've got a programming about green content. Oh, this moment yesterday, you know, between yesterday noon and today, this company saved 20,000 carbon, you know, credits uh, in real time update into it. And the ability to do it where any human can sit down in front of their tablet and create interactive video programming is pretty epic. Yeah. Um, and and I, I think one other point on that is like the, having the publisher or the media company take on some responsibility for developing creative I think is also really key because you know we, we create a lot of vignettes on air that tie in um, the advertiser specifically to the programming and we, you know we know so much about how our audience engages with content so more and more we're, we're working with partners and you know knowing that there are the challenges in developing ad creative and creating a lot of different formats we'll take on some creative responsibility and build that at the actual ad for the marketer that we're working with I feel like that that's really key as well and using our own data around what our audience, how they engage with our content across different platforms, and what the actual content is that we're pushing out, being able to create an advertiser's message together with that is, is key. But again, that's where we end up taking on more of the creative responsibility. If um, they let you. If, if they, they don't just show exactly. up with their 30 second pre roll yeah, and say, yeah, run that, yeah. see you later. Mm -hmm. And that's that's something big that, that we're we're starting down that path now. We're we're creating, you know, so we we piloted a little bit with the USA Now Verizon piece. Um, but we're moving towards, we, we're now producing 35 original short form franchises throughout the week. Some are produced several times a day. Some are produced consistently one day each week. Um, some are produced every day. So we have all of these different options and then we have another large chunk of, of ideas kind of waiting in the wings. So we're producing For the this right content. match. Right, for the right match. Um, with the idea being that we're producing this this content in such a way that I mean we're going to produce it anyway because our, our audience really wants it and so we know the value we know when is the best time to produce this content we know when is the best time to program this content and it's very easy for us because we're producing it in-house to integrate you know we could we're looking at tech partnerships where we have tech reviews and we can integrate products into it, part of that um, and finance, it's very easy to, to introduce finance, various banks or whatever, into our finance discussions. And, um, and so it's easy to, to create this. We know what our audience wants, and we know that all of these franchises will be successful all on their own. 
And it's therefore very easy for us to integrate an advertiser's perspective into that consistent franchise and such so outside of just the traditional, here's a 30 second regurgitated ad. Um, and we're starting to find a lot of success with that just with, I mean, we're, we're starting to really find some, people are very interested in it and, and we're starting to, to ink some new deals and, and have conversations with, with advertisers that weren't interested in having conversations with us previously or on the flip side had come to us and said, we want to advertise, this is all we've got. And it's, well, it's That's a terrible ad. It's not going to work. Right, you know, and, and it's, it's, it's not easy to tell an advertiser that, that it's just not gonna work with our, at, with our audience. I mean, especially since we have, I mean, we're USA Today, we have a massive audience, but we know where they are, when they are there, and we've, we've invested a lot of time. Too, right. right, right. I'd love to take some questions if anybody has any. Mm -hmm. do you, have examples? you talked about the interactivity inside the video pre-rolls. Do you have examples? They asked me to repeat the questions. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm trying to think if we have anything running right right this moment. Um, probably, yeah. So we, I mean, we've done everything from, from we've done some very very simple things. Um, you know, in the very basic sharing. Um, actually, we did something um, last fall with. Um, around movie trailers. We, we packaged movie trailers um, with, uh, who was the advertiser? Dodge, it was Dodge. Um, and we packaged and it was this, these interactive polls as far as what they thought about, you know, which movie were they more excited about? You know, there were there was a few movies that were coming out at the same time that were very similar. So we packaged polls as part of that. Um, and we, they also then went and partnered with some of these. They were doing some series on a few very big movies. And so we pulled that in as well. And using all those creatives in such a way that um, in addition to the polls, they also then created an interactive creative that allowed you to explore the car itself. And we would fly in, um, it was one of the superhero movies. I think it was before Iron Man. But we, we flew in one of the super, I believe it was Iron Man, we flew him in and, and he would explain. And so it was this whole multi-step production where we, you know, it was very involved as far as that level of interactivity. Um, and that was, it was many months in the making and obviously they had to coordinate with the movie, um, with the movie release and they had to coordinate with the studio to get the rights. And, and so there was all of these different pieces and it, and it all just kind of came together at the same time. So that was probably the most extreme example we've had of interactivity. Do you have another question? Please. Again, I'm just curious about Aaron. <clears throat> on your Nielsen OCR stuff, are you guys working with them at all on that? On we, the Nielsen OCR stuff, are you, Aaron, working with them on that? We are, um, we've been testing um, and working together with them on um, accepting their tags so that we can get a sense of how our audience scales from a demo perspective. So with both VCE and OCR, we have been partnering. Um, I think as we move into the upfront time frame right now, that's something that we're, we're definitely gonna be testing. But again, you, you need some massive scale in order to really ensure that you can um, hit some of the demo targets that you need. But right, you don't um, wanna show off the numbers if the numbers aren't there. Yeah. That's for sure. Yep. Do we have any other questions? Please? I've heard of the name. I know a guy named know Dave Anderchuck's a great hockey player. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't even ring a bell? Not to what's, me. What's his thesis? Um, people want things short, sweet, on their own time. Advertising is dead. Uh, everything has to be social and available through multiple channels. Um, why doesn't anyone emerge from the service? I mean, He's not doing such a good job, right? Yeah, <laughs> his, his awareness ain't so good. Maybe you should buy some ads. <laughs> <laughs> I'd tell them to buy some pre-roll, maybe. <laughs> well, it's funny because many of those points, I think they already, I mean, they didn't say shorter is inherently better. They said uh, you need the, the length to match the payoff, and right. duh, yeah. on that one. Point, that, that he makes is that you really need to give away free, give away free, give away content free, and then try and sell it. You have to be free, 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 sell. That's 
Ah, uh, the funnel. And actually, we've so I've run into we did something similar. Um, I was uh, previously at a at, at the Weather Channel actually, and we started with a couple of our products. They were newer products, and we said we don't want to scare people off. Video's new to them. We don't want to scare them away. Um, and uh, so we we said, all right, you know, we'll launch. We'll try it for three months, and then we'll put advertising on it. And that went worse <laughs> because suddenly people were used to getting something for free, and it's you know. It's like Napster when when people are getting things for free. As why a journalist, am I, pay I can Apple relate to it. this idea. You know, the whole idea of if you give it to them for free, good luck getting them to pay later. Yes. No, but I think we see in the publishing world, Wall Street Journal's had success. We've radically changed our experimentation on Time.com for subscription to universal subscription as well as digital. And the snacking piece, having to get multiple frequency. You know, it's, uh, the free heroin doesn't work. It's not heroin, so uh, they don't get hooked up for the first time. I, I think there's definitely something there. Uh, and depending on the type of content and the environment or platform you serve it on, you've got to, you've got to play with a different model. Experimentation, um, I think, is key, and I think that's mm -hmm. come up a couple of mm -hmm. times. Uh, unfortunately, we are still in our early days, many of us, with video, uh, digital video advertising. Yes, yeah, yeah. so, I mean, I, I definitely agree with that to a certain extent, but uh, saying advertising is dead, whatever, dude. Can you um, say clickbait? I, the, yeah, it's like, oh, the banner's dead, the pre-roll's dead, TV's dying. I'm pretty I'm sure I'm dead that. at this point. Thanks. Uh, advertising needs to morph and stay relevant, just like when they say, oh, this print company is going to go out of business. No, if they don't keep their brand relevant, they will, uh, but it doesn't mean advertising is going to go away. Yeah, We're no. going to find ways to get eyeballs. People want to discover products, and uh, advertising And video will actually fuel has that. proved to be an yeah. excellent yeah. channel and, and for and that. Well, that's yeah. really covert or covert. That, and everyone talks about 360 experiences, but you really do, you know, it's like the genies out of the bottle or whatever they say, where it's like vid content is everywhere, so you have to ensure that your content is across all these discoverable platforms. And you've, you've got to make sure that whether it's social, mobile, tablet, wherever it may be, that your, your content is exposed there um, in order to maintain brand vitality. And content includes advertising. Yeah, certainly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you have a question? When do you think your skippable CPM will be the same as your non-skippable CPM? I think you said you almost don't see a difference. Uh, yeah, we didn't, we didn't change our, our rate card. Um, we simply pointed out to our advertisers, and, and we actually we, we got a lot less pushback than we expected, but we didn't change our rate card. We, we simply exposed to them that uh, we showed them all the, the metrics that we had that without this and the complaints that, that they weren't going to get the views anyway. Um, and so if they were able to, it really puts the pressure on them to create good content um, and provide us unique creatives. Um, we found that advertisers that produce, that provide us with multiple creatives um, have a f much higher success rate um, overall. But you know, we didn't change the rate card and we haven't had any pushback from our, any of our advertising partners once we rolled out Skip. All right, so I just want to take a quick minute with my panel. First of all, thank you. You guys are great. Um, and I'd love to give you the opportunity to make a quick takeaway. What is, uh, what, what's the one thing they need to know, need to think about as they're trying to m be successful in this video, digital video ad game? first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no pressure at all. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I wouldn't say that, you know, I, I think the, one of the constant themes that we've talked about is that we need to work directly with our advertising partners to evolve as the industry is evolving. Um, you know, just like any other piece of media and technology, it changes, it evolves. Um, and so if we, if we allow ourselves to stay in the, the strict 30 second TV spot everywhere, it's not gonna go anywhere. Um, and that's where we're starting to see the pushback. But if, if we start to sprinkle in some evolution and some, whether it's interactivities, or it's different formats, shorter, longer, um, you know, high production, low production. You've got everything from the, you know, look at the, the top Super Bowl ads from last year were, were like these three minute long Budweiser commercials that are adorable. Um, <laughs> and then you've also got, on the flip side, the low budget, that first kiss, it's okay, they make it viral, and then it's, oh, by the way, this, it's this it's ad, fake. suddenly everybody's going, oh, I should look that up and, and yeah. see what that company is. So. I think we need to, just as an industry, encourage the, the growth and the movement and the, the evolution and let's try something new and, uh, and grow together. Yeah. Well, I think along those lines, like, you know, testing, 
various ad formats is really key, and I think contextual relevance is extremely important with anything that you do. Mark? Uh, I think the Cubs are going to have a really good season this year. Awesome. <laughs> I'd look out for those guys. No, I'd say um, <clears throat> that uh, I agree with all these guys, but also don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. With great creative and great content are always going to work. 30 seconds can work in the right environment. Mm -hmm. It's these extreme opinions that are great. They have great they headlines. You get out there and you should take, you know, you should definitely heed some of this advice. But when the companies just go, the, the pendulum goes the other way, they tend to hurt their brands, both as content producers or people selling products and services. And the extreme nature is when you really hurt yourself. Great advice. Thank you very much, panelists. Thanks. And thank you Thanks. for listening. Thanks.